The determination of the speed of light has been a great milestone in the history of scientific knowledge. In modern science, there have been numerous ways and even practical experiments that have been done to calculate the value of C. From Cavendish's experiment towards the end of the 19th century to large-scale interferometry in modern days. But who was first? Who was the first person to discover the speed of light? And how did he do it? It all started with the Danish astronomer Ole Römer. In the 17th century, he used the orbital period of one of Jupiter's moon, Io, to determine the value of C. However, the breakthrough was actually unanticipated, and really, Römer did not expect such an awesome discovery. So, how did all of this work? Römer observed Jupiter's moon, Io, as it traversed between two points, where it leaves the view and where it appears again. The time interval between these two points allowed him to calculate the value of C. Now, before we go into the real observations of Romer, we first need to understand an essential graphical part of relativity, Minkowski space-time diagrams. These diagrams are really helpful to explain the motion of one reference frame relative to another, and in effect, the main goal is to represent the position of an object in perspective of another. For example, I might observe a cat in this specific position of space and time, however another person may observe it in a completely different position. Thus, how can we write one perspective according to the other? That is the general wanted outcome from these space-time diagrams. So, with that said, let's dive into what Romer observed. Even at around opposition, Jupiter and its moons are still far enough to make its motion relative to the Earth negligible. That is, the time interval between event 1 and 2 was so short that it would make Jupiter's motion around the Sun insignificant. This can be represented in a space-time diagram, and since Rumor assumed that all the planets are stationary relative to each other, and that it is just Io moving, the diagram looks fairly simple. The line on the right represents the reference frame of the Earth, and the y-axis is the reference frame of Io. Here, the time observed from Earth between points 1 and 2 is denoted by T observed, or T O B S. What's really going on here is that first the actual time interval occurs, T I O, and then since light takes time to reach Earth, Romer, who's on Earth, observed it some time later, and so T observed occurs at a given time after T I O. Also, notice that the two intervals are equal to each other, since again he assumed that everything is stationary. However, as we all know, that is not true. Even though Jupiter does not move by a considerable amount during the time interval, as Io traverses between points 1 and 2, Earth definitely moves a large amount, either away from Jupiter or towards it. During Romer's observations, Earth was moving towards Jupiter, and therefore the space-time diagram would now look slightly different. Earth's world line would tilt slightly to the left, since it's approaching Jupiter. Now, this causes a massive problem. Due to the tilt, an observer on Earth would notice the time interval of Io to be much shorter than it really is. So what is the key to the solution? Romer realized that the real time interval of Io was always absolute. It would never change. Thus, could he find a way to write the observed time, T observed, in terms of TIO? Yes, of course. Events on a space-time diagram are identified by coordinate pairs. These coordinates are different from coordinates on a Cartesian plane, where the first term is referring to the x-axis and the second is referring to the y-axis. Here it is simply the opposite. So let's break up this Minkowski diagram, and to visualize it better, let's annotate each event. The first event occurs when Romer observes Io just moving behind Jupiter at T1 and the Earth is x1 away from Jupiter. Then after a time interval, he instantaneously observes Io coming back from the other side, and this event occurs at t2, when the Earth is closer at x2 from Jupiter. Notice how t2 occurs later, but closer to Jupiter, since remember the Earth is constantly in motion and it is getting closer to Jupiter. There is one more very important thing to notice here. In our diagram, the slope of the red word lines is in fact light propagating with the speed c from Jupiter to Earth. 
speed is distance over time, and therefore the gradient of the line is very simply the value of c. However, as space-time diagrams flip the axes as mentioned previously, the gradient is in fact 1 over c, and this will help us to write t observed in terms of the absolute TIO. Now that we know the details of each event, let's define them and let's take each event one by one. In event 1, the distance from Earth to Jupiter is x1, and therefore the coordinates of event 1 is the following. Keep in mind, as mentioned before, the first term refers to the y-axis, and the second refers to the x-axis. x1 over c basically means t1, because gradient is equal to rise over run, and thus rise, which is t1, is equal to run times the gradient which is x1 over c. Now, in event 2, the distance between Earth and Jupiter is now smaller. It is decreased to x2. Using the same method as event 1, the coordinates of event 2 will consequently be the following. x2 replaces x1, but notice the additional value of TIO, the absolute term interval. This represents the additional time between t1 and t2. So, Romer now had two ways to write the universal times of the corresponding events, 1 and 2. All he had to do now was simple arithmetic calculations. t observed is equal to the difference between t2 and t1. x2 minus x1 is simply the distance that the Earth traverses during the time interval, and thus the time observed is actually equal to the actual time interval when you subtract it by the distance traversed by the Earth over the speed of light. This value can also be simplified into v times t observed over the speed of light, where v is the orbital speed of the Earth, since speed is distance over time. This was more appropriate and convenient 300 years ago. By solving for t observed, we get this. This is the formula that Romer used to calculate the value of c. Amazing, isn't it? Keep in mind this was way back in 1690. So even though Romer knew that he was observing the time interval to be much shorter than in reality, he formulated this brilliant equation that allowed him to calculate the actual interval and thus the speed of light. By tracking the relative motion of Jupiter and Earth, he could find delta x. However, Romer never extracted a formal measurement from his data. But in 1690, a Dutch physicist, Christian Huygens, used his equation and analysis to estimate the speed of light with around 25% error. This was extremely impressive, especially back in 1690. If Romer had access to better technology, like present in today's world, the error would have been very close to zero. On the human scale, light travels astoundingly fast compared to the speeds of most material objects. This is the biggest challenge in measuring its speed. But since astronomers such as Romer could do it more than 300 years ago, it shows the brilliant mind and imagination. And like Einstein himself said, imagination is more important than knowledge.